This will make you more terrified when you think about diving deep under the sea. There are more than a billion species under the sea. Do you know anything about the weird killer of the deep water? You can let us know in the comment section. Welcome back to our channel and today we will tell you about the strangest deep sea killer. The weird killer is known as the lanternfish or Symbolophorus bernardi. Receives its name from its capacity to emit light. Photophores, which are teeny tiny organs, emit the light. Bioluminescence is a chemical process where light is produced by a chemical reaction inside a photophore. The chemical reaction inside the green light sticks that kids use for Halloween is identical to the technique employed by fireflies. The head, belly and tail of the fish all have photophores. These light organs are thought to be employed by lanternfish to draw in other small fish that they eat. They might possibly serve as a mating signal for another lanternfish. In the deep water, there are more than 200 different species of lanternfish. In fact, some of the most frequent deep ocean species are thought to be among them. According to deep sea troll sampling, Lanternfish can account for up to 65% of the biomass in the deep sea. They are thought to play a significant function as prey for larger organisms because they are among the most diversified and extensively dispersed vertebrate species. They are a vital source of food for squid and penguins in southern waters. Although certain species of lanternfish can grow up to 12 inches in length, most species only reach a maximum length of 6 inches. They have very small fins and a body that is extremely slim and compressed, coated in silvery scales. They also have big eyes and a wide, huge head. Deep sea organisms frequently have large eyes because they aid in capturing as much light as possible in the sea's perpetual darkness. The lanternfish's body is covered in photophores, which generate light. By species, these lights are arranged differently. It differs by gender in several species as well. One type of lanternfish is the only one that cannot produce light. During the day, lanternfish migrate vertically, earning them the name. They spend the day in the depths of the ocean, but at night, the surface in quest of food. They do this to mimic the movement patterns of plankton, which are their main source of food. It's believed that these migrations may also aid the lanternfish in avoiding predators. They evade many of the large predators in the shallower waters by retreating to the deep sea during the day. Lanternfish is a vital food source for many creatures at shallower depths, including whales, dolphins, tuna, sharks, seals, squid, and marine birds. Pelagic spawners known as lanternfish are not protecting species. This indicates that the females release their eggs collectively into the water column where the males externally fertilize them. Each fish releases between 100 and 2000 eggs depending on the species. Most species are thought to have year-round spawning. The early larvae have a limited amount of photophores for creating light once the eggs hatch. Until they are fully grown, they are left on their own. Since there are so many lanternfish, it's possible that they make up roughly half of all fish larvae in the ocean. In all of the world's oceans, lanternfish can be found in depths between 1,200 and 3,000 feet, about 360 to 900 meters. The majority of species like to stay close to the coast, where you may frequently see them in big groups near the continental slopes. It has been observed that many species divide among themselves based on depth. Depending on the species, they will layer quite densely. It is thought that this behavior lessens interspecies rivalry. These strata are so dense and packed with fish that sonar can actually detect them. 
The so-called deep scattering layer can reflect sonar signals and create the appearance of a fictitious ocean floor. Oceanographers were perplexed by this phenomenon for a long time until the source was discovered. How did they get to the point where they are now such a success? The prosperity of lanternfish may have started when Antarctica started to float away on its own and because of the emergence of grass on land tens of millions of years ago, according to new research on the part of their ears. In a study that was recently published in the journal Paleobiology, Werner Schwarzens, a geologist and paleontologist at the Natural History Museum of Denmark, and Giorgio Carnevale, an author from the University of Turin in Italy, examined thousands of otoliths, primarily from the lanternfish genus Diaphus. Otoliths, a component of fish ears, can be utilized to distinguish between species by comparing them to those of present-day lanternfish and the rare host skeleton from the past that have been found to be well preserved. Otoliths are one of the most common fossilized bones, and the ear bones of many extinct lanternfish species are the only way to tell them apart. To better understand when the development of lanternfish really took off in the ocean, the researchers studied vast number of otoliths from different regions of the planet. The earliest lanternfish fossils are from a single species that lived in the Paleocene between 66 and 56 million years ago. Following that, more species start to emerge. These fish primarily resided in shallower regions throughout the Middle Eocene which began around 48 million years ago. However, as Antarctica started to separate from South America and Australia after the Eocene, new currents and an influx of silica from deep water into the oceans in the form of nutrient pump started as early as 38 million years ago, according to Schwarzens. Although lanternfish don't consume silica, the copepods and other zooplankton, they do consume silica using diatoms and other tiny phytoplankton. With the rise in silica, diatoms and the copepods that consume them probably multiplied. In order to benefit from the copepod banquet, Schwarzens and his co-author argue that lanternfish have gone into deeper water. Schwarzens and his co-author discovered that while the number of species grew, the size of lanternfish shrunk between 25 million and 11.6 million years ago. However, warm season grasses had already started to cover the land by the late Miocene, 10 million years ago. Wildfires swiftly followed, creating phosphorus and silica that poured into the oceans. Even more silica was produced by erosion from the newly formed Himalayas. According to scientists, a biogenic bloom was brought on these nutrients, Schwarzen stated. Because of this, lanternfish otoliths became the most common type of fish bone in the sediments of the open ocean. Schwarzen remarked, that's when they started to get very intriguing. Rene Martin, a doctoral student at the University of Kansas, who did not participate in this research, but who studies the evolutionary history of lanternfish expressed her admiration for the author's use of otoliths. Two journeys from the same place There were many other kinds of organisms that thrived due to the abundance of silica and plankton, and lanternfish were just one of them. Around the same time, there was also a diversification of the largest mammals. The presence of a plentiful food source allowed baleen whales to thrive. As the amount of grass on land increased and the amount of silica in the ocean increased, baleen whales diversified into a number of different species and, as a result, grew to considerably bigger sizes. It's interesting to note that whales and lanternfish appear to have developed such distinctive approaches to survival. On average, 
lanternfish is just about 10 cm long, which is roughly the width of a human finger, whereas belling whales like the blue whale are the largest organisms that have ever been discovered on this planet. It would appear odd that these two groups evolved in such distinct ways, but according to Martin, they started from very different sizes, and it would have taken a lot longer for lanternfish to grow to such a great size. Whatever it was that made baleen whales and lanternfish successful in the first place is still working for them today because both of these species can be found all throughout the oceans and eat primarily on copepods. The primary distinction between their diets is that whales consume vast quantities of copepods, whereas individual lanternfish feed on phytoplankton in schools that can be larger than a single whale. According to Davis, lanternfish can serve as an indicator of the state of the ocean today just as they did in the past when they responded to major shifts in the temperature and composition of the ocean. Patterns of climate change that have been produced by humans could have an impact on the quantity of these fish. Some research have followed how lanternfish swallow plastic as a way of studying how the material enters into the food web in an open ocean environment. According to Davis, the most important thing to take away from this work is that climate, just like it does now, was probably having an impact on how some of these fishes were flourishing and distributing themselves across large expanses of time. That's it for today. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please like the video and subscribe and turn on the notification before leaving. Thanks for watching.